The Mental State Examination, or MSE, is a structured, comprehensive assessment to evaluate a patient presenting with mental health symptoms. Just like we would perform a cardiovascular examination in a patient presenting with chest pain, we use the MSE in a patient presenting with mental health symptoms. The MSE is commonly used to diagnose and assess the progress of mental health conditions. We use it in the fields of psychiatry, primary care, and emergency medicine. In this video, we're going to cover the aseptic framework, which is a handy acronym to remember the mental state examination. We'll also include how to assess suicide risk after the MSE. Stay tuned until the end of the video to see an example of their mental state examination in action. Let's get started. The A in aseptic stands for appearance and behavior. Appearance refers to a basic description of the patient and can include what they're wearing, their levels of personal hygiene, body habitus, and any physical signs of disease or self-harm. Behaviour refers to how well the patient engages during the consultation. It can include their level of eye contact, facial expression, body language, and the presence of any abnormal movements such as tremors, tics, involuntary movements, or posturing. For example, in a patient with depression, you may note that they appear to have poor self-care and hygiene, avoid eye contact and have psychomotor retardation or slow movements or delayed responses to questions. In a patient with mania, you may notice that they appear to wear extravagant bright outfits. They're hyperactive and maintain intense unrelenting eye contact and can have psychomotor agitation. The S in aseptic stands for speech. The assessment of a patient's speech can be further broken down into rate, quantity, tone, volume, and rhythm. A patient's rate of speech can range anywhere from slow to pressured speech, which is when they are speaking rapidly and can be difficult to interrupt. Quantity refers to the amount of speech and can range from being mute to having very little or poverty of speech, all the way to excessive speech. Tone refers to intonation or the variability in speech. Some examples include monotonous speech or tremulous speech, which can be seen in anxiety disorders. The patient's volume of speech can range from quiet to loud. Rhythm of speech can refer to characteristics of speech such as stammering, stuttering, slurring, or stilted speech. For example, a patient with depression may have slow, quiet, monotonous, and poverty of speech. A patient with mania, on the other hand, may have pressured, loud and confident speech that is difficult to interrupt. Next, we move on to the E in aseptic, which stands for emotion. Emotion can be broken down into its two components, mood and affect. Mood is subjective and refers to the patient's own assessment of their current emotional state. This can simply be assessed by asking the patient, how are you feeling? Patients may describe their mood as low, anxious, angry, enraged, euphoric, or apathetic, to name a few. Conversely, affect is objective and refers to what the examiner observes during the consultation. Affect includes the patient's apparent emotion. It also includes the reactivity of their emotional state, which can be described as fixed, restricted, or labile. Affect can also be described in terms of intensity. For example, affect can be exaggerated, blunted, flat, or normal. Lastly, it's always important to make an assessment of congruency. That means, does the patient's reported mood match their affect? If it does, we say that the mood and affect are congruent. If there is a discrepancy between mood and affect, we say that they are incongruent. For example, someone with depression may have a low mood with a blunted affect. Someone who is manic may have an elevated mood with a labile affect. Someone with schizophrenia may appear happy when describing upsetting events. This would be an example of an incongruent mood and affect. Next, we move on to perception, which is the P in aseptic. Perception refers to assessing the sensory information of the world around us, and there can be different types of perceptual abnormalities. For example, a hallucination is when someone sees, hears, feels, smells, or tastes something that isn't really there. It feels completely real to the person, even though there is no external source. For example, a patient with auditory hallucinations may hear voices, but there is no sound present. 
Hallucinations can happen in conditions like schizophrenia, psychosis, or drug use. A pseudo-hallucination is just like a hallucination, but with one key difference, and that is that the individual recognises that it is not real. An illusion is a misinterpretation of a real external stimulus. Unlike hallucinations where there is no real stimulus, illusions occur when something is actually present, but the brain perceives it incorrectly. For example, a patient may hear the sound of the wind and think that someone is whispering. Depersonalization is another example of a perceptual abnormality. It refers to a feeling of being detached or disconnected from yourself, as if you're watching yourself from the outside. Derealization is a sense that the world around someone is not a true reality. For example, a patient with schizophrenia may say, I hear voices talking about me all the time, when in fact there is no sound around them. This is an auditory hallucination. Another example is that a patient with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, may say, it feels like I'm watching myself from the outside, which is an example of depersonalization. The T in aseptic stands for thought, and thought can be further broken down into thought content, thought form, and thought possession. Thought content refers to the actual substance of the patient's thoughts. This can be assessed by asking the patient, What's been on your mind recently? Examples of thought content include delusions, which are fixed false beliefs, obsessions, overvalued ideas. It's also important to assess if the patient is having any suicidal or homicidal thoughts. Thought form refers to how a patient moves from one thought to another. In healthy individuals, thought form should be logical and at a steady pace. Abnormalities in thought form can include Loose associations, where a patient moves rapidly from one topic to another with no apparent connection between the topics. It can also include circumstantial thoughts, which include lots of unnecessary or irrelevant detail, but eventually come back to the same point. Tangential thoughts include digressions from the main subject of conversation. Flight of ideas refers to fast, pressured speech when ideas run into one another, making it difficult for the observer to follow the conversation. Thought blocking refers to a sudden cessation of thought, typically mid-sentence, with the patient unable to recover what they previously said. Perseveration refers to the repetition of a particular response. For example, the patient may keep repeating their name in response to all of the questions being asked of them during the examination. Neologisms is when a patient has made up words which are unintelligible or don't make sense. And a word salad is when a patient speaks a random string of words without relation to one another. Thought possession refers to things like thought insertion, which is a belief that thoughts can be inserted into the patient's mind. You can assess for this by asking the patient, do you think people can put ideas into your head without your control? Thought withdrawal refers to a belief that one's thoughts can be removed from their mind. And this can be assessed by asking the patient, do you feel like others can remove memories or thoughts from your mind? Thought broadcasting is the belief that others can hear a patient's thoughts. And this can be assessed by asking the patients, do you think that other people can, can hear your thoughts? For example, a patient with schizophrenia may say, the FBI has been following me for months. This would be an example of a persecutory delusion. They may say, the government is implanting thoughts in my head which would be an example of thought insertion. And they may say, the sun is shining today. I like oranges. Oranges are round like the earth. And this would be an example of a loose association. The eye of aseptic refers to insight and judgment. Insight refers to the patient's ability to understand their own condition and can be assessed by asking them, do you think you have a problem at the moment? Insight can be referred to as intact, partially present or impaired. Judgment refers to the patient's ability to make decisions or solve problems in their current psychological state. For example, you may ask them, what would you do if you could smell smoke in your house? And assess their response as either being intact or impaired. For example, a patient with depression may say, I don't need to take medication, I'm fine. And this would demonstrate that they have poor insight. A patient who has mania may say, I've decided to quit my job all of a sudden and spend all of my savings on a new business venture. I'm sure it'll make me a millionaire. 
This would be an example of poor judgment. Next, we have cognition, which is the C in aseptic. This should include an assessment of the patient's level of consciousness. For example, are they alert, drowsy, delirious, or in a stupor? It should also assess whether they are oriented to person, time, and place, an assessment of their memory, for example, short-term versus long-term memory, and whether it remains intact. And we also need to assess their ability to concentrate and whether they need redirection during the conversation or are easily distractible. When assessing cognition, it may be helpful to use a formal assessment tool that's been validated, such as the Mini Mental State, or MMSE, or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or MOCA. For example, a patient with depression may have a difficulty concentrating and demonstrate signs of memory loss. After you've completed aseptic, don't forget to complete a risk assessment. This is a key component of the mental state examination. The risk assessment includes the patient's risk to themselves and their risk to others. When assessing the patient's risk to themselves, you can ask them a question such as, have you had any thoughts to hurt or harm yourself or take your own life? It's important to assess the patient's suicide risk, whether they've had any suicidal thoughts, have they made any plans, and have they acted on those plans? It's also important to assess the patient's self-harm risk and look for evidence of injury. It's also important to identify risk factors for the patient, such as vulnerability, which could include substance abuse, homelessness, or isolation. When assessing the patient's risk to others, you may ask them, have you had any thoughts to harm others? Assessing them for violence or aggression can be important in this situation. Let's run through a quick example. We have John Doe, a 32-year-old male, who presents with persistent low mood and fatigue. You've been asked to assess his mental state examination. He is a Caucasian male of stated age, wearing dark trousers and a blue t-shirt. He's slightly unkempt and is not making eye contact at all. His speech is soft, slow and monotonous with long pauses before responding. John reports feeling empty and exhausted. His affect is flat and restricted with minimal reactivity. His mood and affect are congruent. He does not report any hallucinations and he's not responding to any external stimuli. His thought process is logical but slow. He has feelings of worthlessness and guilt. He denies having any delusions and reports passive suicidal thoughts but does not have any intent or a specific plan. He acknowledges feeling depressed but attributes it to personal failure rather than a medical condition. His judgment is intact, although he's pessimistic about seeking help. He's alert and oriented and has some reduced concentration. His memory is intact. So there you have it, guys. That's a summary of the mental state examination using the aseptic framework. Don't forget to assess the patient's risk at the end. That's all for this video. For more information, check out the onepagemedicine.com website or follow us on Instagram at onepagemedicine. Until next time. Thank you.